Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today I'm doing my first History Marsh video, Hannibal. I'm going to do part one and two today, and then tomorrow or the next day, depending on when I do the next Napoleon video, I'll do the rest of this one. But yeah, Hannibal, parts one and two by History Marsh. Let's get into it. After General Hasdrubal the Fair was assassinated by a Celtic slave, 26-year-old Hannibal was elected as the new Carthaginian commander. The young general immediately made plans to invade Rome, but he couldn't begin the campaign before strengthening Carthage's control over the Iberian Peninsula. So Hannibal went to work. He launched two highly successful campaigns in 221 and 220 BC, extending Carthaginian influence beyond the Tagus River. But while on the return route to New Carthage, Hannibal was taken by surprise by a coalition of Iberian tribes. Led by the Carpetani tribe, the Iberians assembled a large army. They blocked Hannibal's path and fortified their position against the Tagus River, then waited for the Carthaginian general to attack. Here, Hannibal showed his military genius for the first time. Instead of attacking the Iberians head-on, he erected his own fortified camp and waited. By day's end, his scouts found a river crossing to the southeast. During the wee hours of the night, Hannibal ordered a small contingent to stay in the camp and keep all campfires burning, creating the illusion that the whole Carthaginian army was still encamped. Meanwhile, he led his army on a swift flanking maneuver further up the river. By sunrise the next day, Hannibal was behind the Iberian position, feigning retreat towards New Carthage. Thinking that the Carthaginians were retreating, the Iberians rushed to intercept them. But once they were midstream, Hannibal sprung his trap and unleashed his cavalry. Iberian infantrymen, chest deep in the fast-flowing river, couldn't offer much resistance and were cut down with ease by the Carthaginian cavalry charge. Those who managed to cross were trampled by the elephants. By now, the Iberian army lost all cohesion and the mass of tribal warriors started fleeing. Hannibal ordered his army to pursue them across the river, completely routing the enemy. On the Tagus River, Hannibal had his first major victory, but Rome took notice. Wanting to stop Hannibal's expansion, the Romans made their presence felt. Already allied with the wealthy and powerful city of Saguntum, Rome declared it their protectorate, an act that Hannibal perceived as a violation of the treaty signed by the two great powers in 225 BC, which... So the treaty is going to talk about, uh, essentially, they have designated a line on this is our influential space and that's your area of influence over there between Rome and Carthage or Rome and I guess New Carthage because Hannibal is kind of doing his own thing away from Carthage over here in Spain. So they are going to argue and not just they, historians to this day argue whether or not Saguntum fell on which side of this line, which side of the river it fell on. However, it's going to end up with Rome saying it's on our side, Hannibal saying it's on their side. Hannibal then is going to go and essentially take Saguntum. Rome is actually in a war away from here right now, and so they don't actually have the ability to get over there and help, or it would stretch them too thin if they did. So, although they protest it, they kind of have to give Saguntum up or leave Saguntum to its own devices, which is going to end up with Hannibal taking it. Divided the Iberian Peninsula along the Ebro River into Carthaginian and Roman spheres of influence. A sworn enemy of Rome, it didn't take long before Hannibal acted. He marched on Saguntum, 
and besieged the city. In 219 BC, the Carthaginian army reached the outskirts of Saguntum. The city was heavily fortified, situated atop steep slopes and cliffs high above the surrounding plain. Saguntines requested aid from Rome, but the Romans were busy fighting the Illyrians. Nevertheless, with provisions stockpiled, Saguntum was prepared. Besieging it would not be easy. Hannibal installed a blockade around the entire city and placed most of his forces at the western end. Saguntines stubbornly kept pushing every Carthaginian assault back, but the siege went on for months and the many assaults gradually wore down portions of the wall. Eventually, the defenders had to abandon their outer defenses and form up behind the inner wall. Slowly and relentlessly, Hannibal's army made progress. And after eight brutal months, the Saguntines made their last stand at the citadel. Soon after, the city fell. Inhabitants that survived the siege were either killed or sold into slavery. I've talked about this in a previous video, but it's something that is very important in how these armies maintain themselves. Slavery is a huge financial backer for the ability to keep armies in the field in these times, right? So you have a general, which, at you know, Hannibal is getting silver from, from Spain, from New Carthage, but the ability for ancient armies to keep themselves in the field continuously without a major, major state backer was wholly dependent on slavery. Now, Hannibal has a major state backer here, but he and that major state backer owe a ton of money to Rome for the First Punic War, and it's actually how Hannibal is going to respond to Rome when Rome comes to him and says, you know, what the hell are you doing down here? He's like, well, I'm trying to get the money collected that we owe you from the First Punic War, and just kind of sends them away that way. Um, but it's a huge part of how armies maintain themselves. They get food and supplies from these villages, and they get money by selling the inhabitants that aren't killed into slavery. And it's actually a way that a lot of generals kind of overpay or overcompensate their armies. They will, as a like quote unquote bonus, like gift every soldier a slave, right? And that's what that is. That's it's a bonus. That's that's literally what it's looked looked at like. And so it's a huge, huge part of the equation in these ancient military conflicts. After the fall of Saguntum, Rome demanded justice for what they perceived was the violation of the treaty, and claiming that Saguntum was in the Roman sphere of influence according to the treaty, they asked Carthage to hand over Hannibal to Rome so he can be punished. But the Carthaginian Senate stood by their general, and by the end of the year, the Second Punic War began. There's a really good quote of the Roman diplomat who is sent to Carthage, to the Carthaginian Senate, to essentially ask for Hannibal. And I can't think of the quote exactly, but it's something to the effect of, uh, I hold in my toga both peace and war, Cho you know, choose what you will. And uh, they, they said back, you know, basically like, it's up to you. And he says, okay, the Roman diplomat says, okay, then I choose war. And then the whole Senate erupts in, we accept it. It's a really, really cool scene. I don't do it justice with the kind of abridged version I gave there, but it's a really cool back and forth to the start of this war. Hannibal wintered in New Carthage, preparing for the upcoming campaign. He placed his brother Hasdrubal in charge of Iberia, with 15,000 troops and 21 elephants, along with a fleet of ships to protect the coastline. 
To break possible tribal allegiances, around 15,000 Iberian infantry were swapped for 15,000 African infantry, who were more reliable, sending the Iberians to Carthage and Libya to bolster defenses against a possible Roman landing. And in the spring of 218 BC, with the full support from the Senate, Hannibal marched out of New Carthage with 54,000 infantry and 8,000 cavalry, dividing his army into three columns. But beyond the Ebro, tribes allied to Rome were hostile to the Carthaginians, and it took Hannibal about two months to pacify the region. He placed around 10,000 troops under the command of Hanno, ordering him to establish a line of defense on the Ebro against possible incursions into Carthaginian territory. With 38,000 infantry, 7,000 cavalry, and 37 elephants left at his disposal, Hannibal crossed the mountains and encamped on the other side of the Pyrenees. Meanwhile, the Romans divided their forces. Their plan was to send consul Publius Cornelius Scipio to intercept Hannibal in Iberia. Simultaneously, consul Tiberius Sempronius Longus sailed to Sicily with the intent of attacking Carthage itself if Scipio managed to stop Hannibal's advance. Additional Roman forces were left to guard the recently conquered Gallic lands in the Po Valley, a region the Romans called Cisalpine Gaul. Back at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains. So Rome is not expecting an attack on mainland Italy at all, at all. I mean, you can see here, they are sending everybody in every direction except Italy, right? And so they're going on the offensive here. They have no real fear of an attack of the mainland. And they have kind of a buffer zone here because you have Cis and Transalpine Gaul. And there are Gallic tribes here that are very devoted to Rome, okay? There are what they call short-haired Gauls and toga-wearing Gauls. Um, those were the Romanized tribes of, of, you know, the Gauls or the Celts. Um, but there are a lot in here that are not, and they hate Rome. They hate everything about Rome. And so there's kind of this back and forth match here and Hannibal is going to take a gamble on that he can bring those other you know Gallic tribes that hate Rome over to his side and it's kind of successful but he has to be a little bit ruthless in how he goes about it Hannibal laid the groundwork for the invasion rather than fighting his way towards Rome he did everything to avoid conflict with the Gallic tribes, mostly paying them for free passage through their territory, promising that his only interest is to fight Rome. Moreover, Carthaginian messengers returning from the Po Valley assured Hannibal that the Gallic tribes there would welcome him, and that they had already began hostilities against Rome in anticipation of his arrival. This was welcome news for Hannibal, because he knew the Po Valley could provide more manpower and act as a staging point for operations into Roman territory. As Hannibal approached the River Rhone, Scipio's army disembarked at Massalia to resupply while on their way to Iberia. The Roman general knew that Hannibal crossed the Pyrenees, but he wrongly estimated that the Carthaginian general was still far from the Rhone. In truth, Hannibal's army was only four days' march away from Massalia. Hannibal rested his army for three days in hostile territory and began preparations to cross the Rhone. With the Roman army just four days away, Hannibal wanted to avoid a set-piece battle with the Gauls, eager to press on towards the Italian peninsula as soon as possible. But on the opposite riverbank, encamped was the army of the Cavaras tribe, a Roman ally. They gathered all their boats and built a barrier on the riverbank in preparation to contest the Carthaginian crossing. But Hannibal devised a cunning plan. On the third night, under the cover of darkness, he sent a flanking detachment under the command of Hanno, son of Bomilcar, some 40 kilometers, 25 miles north. 
Hanno crossed the river and rested his troops for one day. On the second night after leaving the Carthaginian camp, Hanno's detachment again moved during the night, eventually deploying behind the Cavares camp at dawn. The trap was set. Early next morning, Hanno used smoke to signal Hannibal to start crossing the Rhone. As the Carthaginian vessels were lowered into the massive river, Cavara's army formed a line on the opposite riverbank. Hannibal was one of the first to cross to the roars and cheers from his men on the western bank. As the Carthaginians started disembarking on the eastern riverbank, Hanno sent a part of his force to loot and destroy the Cavara's camp, while he personally led the charge against the Gauls near the river. The Cavaras were stunned by the flanking maneuver, and they began fleeing the field in panic, unable to cope with Hannibal's perfectly synchronized attacks. With the Gauls scattered, the battle was soon over, and the Carthaginians hastily proceeded to cross the river. Most of Hannibal's troops crossed the Rhone by the end of the day, while it took another day to get the elephants across the river. While the Carthaginian army gathered on the eastern bank, friendly Gallic messengers from the tribes in the Po Valley arrived, warning Hannibal that a Roman fleet is anchored nearby. Hannibal sent his scouts to locate Scipio's army, and incredibly, not long after, his Numidian scouts stumbled into a Roman Gallic scouting party. Both generals now knew of each other's whereabouts. Scipio quickly moved north to confront Hannibal, but by the time the Romans reached the crossing point a few days later, only an empty Carthaginian camp was left behind. Hannibal had no time to waste. He had to reach the Alps before the winter. But trouble was brewing in Iberia. Scipio placed his brother, Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Calvus, in charge of leading the army into Iberia, while he headed back to the Po Valley to assume command of Roman troops there and prepare for the Carthaginian invasion. Scipio Calvus, now in charge of the invasion force, disembarked at Emporiae. The Greek trading cities and the Iberian tribes in the region welcomed the Romans. But even prior to the arrival of Roman troops, the Carthaginians began to lose control over the conquered region, as Hanno's force wasn't large enough to conduct offensive operations. What's worse, Hanno only learned about the Roman arrival when Scipio Calvus was well on his way towards the Ebro River. He sent word to Hasdrubal, who began marching north with 8,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry. But instead of waiting for Hasdrubal, Hanno marched out with 10,000 troops to meet the 20,000-strong Roman army. Scipio Calvus easily crushed the Carthaginians, killing 6,000 and capturing 2,000 troops, along with Hanno himself. Once Hasdrubal arrived, he didn't have enough troops to meet the Romans in battle, so he launched fast-moving raids along the coast. Carthaginian raiders killed many Roman sailors as they were foraging, reducing the effectiveness of the Roman fleet by half. Nevertheless, Rome now had full control over Iberia, north of the Ebro River, a serious blow to the Carthaginian war effort. Moreover, northern Iberia would become a base of operations for Roman incursions into Carthaginian territory, south of the Ebro River. Meanwhile, having marched one of the things that you continuously see in this conflict is Rome is so unique in its ability to continuously expand its, not its grip, but continuously expand its military, right? So whereas you have Carthage, who it, Carthage mostly trades. That's why it's a big power. It's a big naval power. It, it comes from the wealth of trading, right? Rome also has traders. They also have, you know, all of the things that, that everybody else has, but they are so structured in their, in their military might that they are able to just continuously kind of repress and put out more troops over and over and over again. And that's something that is just, almost unique 
in in this time period is their ability to do that. And so what you see because of that is Rome is very less cautious in the way that they approach a lot of this stuff because they don't really have a fear of running out of troops or don't have that fear in the same way that like the Carthaginians do. So the Carthaginians have Hannibal. He's very calculated. Um, he looks at all of these different things when going into battle. Uh, he's trying to bring tribes over to his side. That's what he's trying to do. And so he's more like a scalpel and he's going in and doing all this very meticulously planned stuff. Whereas Rome and their armies that they're sending out, they are the hammer, right? And no matter how many Hannibal seems to kill, they just will reprint, literally just reprint an army and send a, a bigger one out next time. And they do it over and over and over. And the ability for their society to take the hits, the losses in manpower, in everything that is about to come is is wild and like i said it's essentially unique for the time period touched his forces over the alps hannibal would soon turn the italian peninsula into a war zone in a campaign that would elevate him to a general of legendary status Okay, so that was part one. I've decided that I'm going to split the two parts because that one was kind of long. Um, and I don't want to make these like 45 minute videos, but I'm going to do the next one right now. It'll be out probably a couple hours after this one. But that was History Marshes Hannibal part one. Like, comment, subscribe. The second one will be out in a little bit and I'll see you guys then.